4, verses 1 through 20. <clears throat> Again, he began to teach beside the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea, and the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables, and in his teaching he said to them, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun arose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it out, and it yielded no grain. And other seed fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see but not perceive, and may indeed hear but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. And these are the ones along the path where the word is sown when they hear. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit, thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. This is God's word. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the teaching of Jesus. We thank you for this parable, and we ask that you would give us ears to hear, that your word would not fall on rocky or thorny soil, but that we would receive the ears to hear that you offer graciously. Would you give them to us now? In Christ's name, amen. So on, next to my desk in my office on a bookshelf is a print of Van Gogh's The Sower. Uh, and it's really meaningful to me for a lot of reasons. Uh, Van Gogh is Megan's favorite artist. Uh, the imagery of sowing seeds is meaningful to me. Uh, and actually many of you signed that print uh, at my ordination service. Um, but the imagery of sowing and reaping was meaningful to Van Gogh. And actually, the print I have is one of 30, I think. He, he uh, did over 30 different versions of the sower. And Van Gogh loved painting really earthy things like farmers and fields and trees and he often painted the natural world, and he captured so well the humanity of things. But at the same time, he uncovered something beyond. And this is what he did with his paintings. He painted the deep, transcendent realities of life with the imagery of the everyday. And it's interesting that this is exactly what the parable of the sower does. It's what all the parables do. They use the imagery and the language of the everyday of farmers and seeds and soil, and they put forth deep spiritual truths. But they confuse us. They puzzle us. They actually don't make things clearer. They, like one commentator said, they knock us off balance. But this parable shows 
us why Jesus taught this way. And at the same time, it shows us how the kingdom of God works. And so we see two things in this parable. We see kingdom growth, how the kingdom grows, and we see a kingdom invitation, how we get in. Kingdom growth, kingdom invitation. So let's start with kingdom growth, how the kingdom grows. So Mark began in chapter 1 with Jesus saying, Behold, the kingdom of God is at hand. Essentially, God's perfect rule through his king, the promised Messiah, to make all things right and to restore shalom. This kingdom has broken in. Not in its fullness yet, but we're seeing light shining through the cracks. And right away, we see the power of this kingdom in chapters 1 through 3 through the healings that Jesus does. And then we get to chapter 4 and Jesus begins teaching about the kingdom. And in verse 3, he begins by saying, a sower went out to sow. Now remember, many of these people were waiting the Messiah, the God's anointed one, the one who would come and bring uh, military victory, or so they thought, who would come triumphantly and crush his enemies and bring political revolution. This, this was going to be big. But Jesus uses the slow, simple, mundane imagery of a farmer. And then in verse 14, when Jesus explains this parable to us, he says that the sower sows the word. So this is how the kingdom of God is breaking in, not through coercion or force, but through the power of Jesus' word. And nothing could be more ordinary than words. But, as we all know, words have power. They have power like seeds. And I've heard from many of you recently about your home gardens, the, the basil and the peppers and the flowers and the tomatoes. And you, you know that there is nothing big or fast or impressive about growing these things. Planting these seeds is the gentlest act, but those seeds have power. They have power to transform the soil. They have power to bring life, and Jesus' words certainly have power. Jesus' words have divine power. He speaks as the Son of God, and the words that he sows are the same words that created the world. They're the same words we've seen already in Mark, forgive sin and heal evil spirits and heal broken bodies. These are the same words that Jesus used to call his disciples. There are things that Jesus does with his voice that cannot happen any other way. His words have the power to bring about the promises of God. And this is what we see happen in the parable. We, we focus so much on the soils that we don't see the end, do we? The 30-fold and 60-fold and 100-fold harvest. This, we can read right past this, but this would have shocked his listeners. An average harvest in that time was about seven and a half fold. A really good harvest was tenfold. So 30-fold was incredible. 60-fold would have been unimaginable. 100-fold would have been impossible without the work of God. The only other time we see a 100-fold harvest is in Genesis 26, which says God blessed Isaac and he reaped a 100-fold. This is a picture of divine blessing. But this divine blessing is expansive. In verse 32, Jesus says that the kingdom is like a seed growing into a tree big enough for the birds to come and nest in. And the Old Testament prophets used the same language of birds to talk about the nations coming in and dwelling in the kingdom. This is blessing for all the nations. Now, do you see the power that Jesus is talking about? A seed that begins so small but brings about God's promises to Abraham. His promise that in him all the families of the earth shall be blessed. In fact, it's not just the promise to Abraham, but 
Every promise in Scripture from Genesis to Revelation finds their fulfillment in this kingdom. And one day when this kingdom comes in its fullness, every brokenness in the human life will be healed. Every injustice will be made right. Every tear will be wiped away. We will see the face of God. And it's this kingdom that has broken in and it's growing like a seed and it is brought about by Jesus' words. Now you may hear all that and you may think the kingdom of God, blessing of Abraham. This, this is the 21st century. None of this has any bearing on my life. But whether you buy into the kingdom of God or something else, we're all trying to reap a hundredfold harvest. We are all after something to give us that kind of yield. One author describes this universal desire of ours with the language of performing. This is what he says. He says, now everyone in this world to some degree is in the middle of a stressful and hurried performance. All of us are chasing magnificence originated by our own energy. Magnificence originated by our own energy. And there's two things I think that are so insightful about this quote. And the first is that we are all after magnificence. We all want to matter. We all want to feel special, to be accepted. In other words, we want to be justified. But we also know that that's going to take energy or power. And so what do we do? We exhaust ourselves performing. We frantically scatter all kinds of seeds with politics and education and work and relationships. And we perform and perform and perform saying, look at me. I stand for the right causes. I back the right side. I'm making a difference. I work really hard. I make good money. I am valuable. I'm raising my kids the right way. I'm managing all my relationships. I'm keeping the peace. And on top of all that, I do all this while practicing self-care. I'm finding myself. I'm being true to myself. I'm moisturizing. I am <laughs> doing the anti-aging thing. I am special, aren't I? Aren't I enough? Look at me. Accept me. But these things don't work. And they never could because you and I were created for real magnificence. Created for a hundredfold harvest, a forest of divine blessing. We were created for the magnificence of the face of God. And that could never come for our own, from our own power. We were created for a harvest that can only be brought about by God. And only Jesus' words can lead to this magnificence. Only his words can speak into the emptiness that we feel and cause growth. And so how can you tell if you're trusting your power or the power of Jesus' words? Well, performing is really exhausting. And so let me ask you, are you tired? Do you feel like Bilbo Baggins when he said he feels thin like butter spread over too much bread? Because if you're trying to find magnificence through your own power, you can't stop performing because then you risk losing your magnificence. But the promise of God's kingdom is this. There is a real magnificence to be had, a 100-fold harvest, but it's not by your energy, it's not by your power, but by the power of the word of God. And so how can we participate in that? How do we get that harvest? How do we get into the kingdom? Well, let's look now at the kingdom invitation. Jesus tells us the way into the kingdom of God. He shows us how to reap this harvest. And we come here in this passage to another Markin sandwich that Jonathan told us about last week, where Mark tells a story and he interrupts his own story and the key to understanding the story is what is in the middle. And so the key to the hundredfold harvest here is in verses 10 through 12, when Jesus says, To you, the secret of the kingdom is given, but to those outside, everything is in parables, so they don't understand. 
Now, why? Why did they get the harvest? Why are there these two groups? Well, it's so subtle, you might miss it. Notice where the disciples are when he tells them this. Verse 10, And when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. The secret was given to them because they came to him. They came inside and they asked Jesus. Now, our family is in our birthday party era. The girls are constantly getting invitations to birthday parties. They are covering our refrigerator. And teachers only allow you to give out invitations if you have one for everyone. And so the invitations are sewn throughout the whole class. And naturally what happens is some kids show up and some don't. Some get the invitation, but they're not really friends, so they don't come. Others get it, and they've come to your parties in the past, but that's when you had a pool, and you've, you've moved now, and so they stop coming. And then the real friends get the invitation, and they come. Now imagine at that birthday party, the birthday girl says, To you has been given the secret of my party. Behold the magnificence of this birthday cake, the magnificence of this bounce castle, the magnificence of being with me. Why? Because you came. The power, the secret of the kingdom is Jesus himself, and those in verse 10 get it because they come to him. They didn't just receive the invitation, they accepted it. They followed it. And this is so crucial to understand. No one is kept outside the family of God by, by, because of what they do or don't do. No one's kept outside the family of God because they have weeds or thorns or rocks. The only thing that will keep you from God is trying to be your own God. The only thing that keeps you outside is saying, <laughs> Jesus' magnificent kingdom. I don't need that. I'm magnificent. I can get my own weeds out, my own thorns out. I can make myself good. I can be magnificent out of my own power. The only thing that keeps you out is not accepting the invitation, not coming to the gardener and letting him remove the weeds and the thorns and the rocks by the transforming power of his word. The parables are an invitation into this kingdom, and invitations divide. Some hear and accept. They go. They go inside. They say, please take my weeds and my thorns and my rocks. And some hear and reject and walk away. And maybe the best picture of this is actually in Scripture in Exodus 13 and 14, when we see the pillar of cloud appear. If you remember those chapters, Exodus 13, God's people are fleeing from Pharaoh. They're fleeing from slavery in Egypt, and God is leading them towards the Red Sea. And we read in verse 21 of chapter 13, it says, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. But when they got to the sea, when Pharaoh changed his mind, when he hardened his heart towards God and towards God's people, the pillar of cloud moved. In Exodus 14, Verse 19 says, The pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. It divided God's people from Pharaoh's army. For Pharaoh and his men, the cloud revealed their hardness of heart towards God, toward his people. And for the Israelites, it revealed their trust in the Lord as they followed him into the water. Do you see why they were saved? It wasn't because they weren't afraid. It wasn't because they had all the answers. 
It's not because they looked the right way or voted the right way or raised their kids the right way or made enough money. It wasn't because they were magnificent. No, despite their doubt, despite their fear, their lack of fruit, their weeds, their thorns, their rocks, they kept moving with the pillar into the water. Because as Pastor Tim Keller always said, it's not the measure of your faith, it's the object of your faith. You're not saved by having magnificent faith, you're saved by having faith in the God who graciously invites you into the water, even if your faith is a tiny seed. And this is how the parables work. They divide between good soil and bad soil. The bad soil, those who don't bear fruit, the parables reveal the hardness. But the good soil, those who do bear fruit, are the ones who hear the gracious invitation and follow. Those who follow Jesus, go to Jesus, ask him, but not just once. And this is the key. It's in the word here in this parable. Now I'm going to break a preaching rule to not talk about the Greek and Hebrew too much, because really that's just another way for me to say, aren't I special? Aren't I so smart? I know Greek. But in this case, I think it actually makes all the difference in the world. Because there are two different kinds of hearing. Those who hear and don't bear fruit, the verb for hear there is in the aorist tense. And that tense means simple, final action. Jesus spoke, they heard, in one ear, out the other. They got the invitation, but it stayed on the refrigerator. Those who hear and bear fruit, the verb here is in the present tense. This tense means active, continual, ongoing action. Jesus spoke, they heard him, and then they went to him, and they asked him and said, we don't understand, we want to understand, we want to hear more, explain this to us. They got the invitation and they ran to the party. And this is what it looks like to be given the secret of the kingdom. Drawing near to Jesus more and more is the fruit that you have been given the secret. Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. If you keep drawing to Jesus, it's because the Father is drawing you. Jesus says the only thing that's required is ears to hear, and God gives everything that he requires. The continual asking is evidence that you've been given ears to hear. But you won't ever do this unless you see Jesus for who he really is. Until you see Jesus as more magnificent than anything else, you won't be compelled to come. So who is Jesus? Well, last week, Jonathan pointed out how important place is in Mark's gospel. We saw him beside the sea. We saw him on the mountain. And it's so interesting where Jesus is during this parable. Did you catch it? He's on the sea. He's in a boat. He's in the water, just like the cloud that surrounded God's people through the Red Sea. This is who Jesus is. Jesus is the God who saves us through the water by taking us into himself. Only in him can you make it through the water to the promised land, to the kingdom. Why? Because Jesus is the seed of the kingdom. The Father sowed the Son onto the earth. The most insignificant seed, born in Bethlehem to a virgin, worked as a carpenter. But the power of his teaching and his healing went forth, and some followed him and some rejected him. And then on the cross, he took on himself all of our weeds and our thorns and our rocks. Everything that would keep his word out, he took on himself. And then like a seed, he went into the dirt of the tomb and he died. But he exploded with life. 
He resurrected from the dead as the first fruits of the kingdom of God. And this is the fruit we bear if we are in him. We bear his fruit because if you hear his words and follow him in faith, he covers you like a cloud. He takes you into himself and everything he has becomes yours. The fruit of his spirit, the fruit of his kingdom, 30-fold and 60-fold and 100-fold. When you see Jesus as this, when you see him who, he, who he's revealed himself to be, who could stop running to him? One of the interesting things about Van Gogh's The Sower is that the sower is always faceless. There's mystery to it. We don't know who this sower is. We're, there's a distance. We're kept outside. But Jesus is not a faceless sower. He came to reveal the secret of the kingdom. He came to reveal to us who he is, the fullness of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the key to the parables. He's the way into the kingdom. We get in by being in him. And so the parables are invitations inside to look at him to look in Jesus' face, to listen to his words, to put your faith in his magnificence, not your own, and then to keep listening and to keep going to him, to keep hearing his invitation over and over and over again and letting his words transform your heart, letting the seed of the kingdom grow as you wait for a hundredfold harvest. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the parables. We thank you that you have come in the definitive person of Jesus, but you've come with an invitation. You invited us inside to a relationship with you despite our weeds and thorns. Would we hear Jesus' words and would we run to him? Pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. Would you please stand? We're going to now going to confess, affirm.